afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Um, so yeah, we're here to talk about alternative data, and we're going to look at that from a number of different angles. We have a very illustrious panel here, all experts in their own field around alternative data. Is that better? Yep. Um, so let's get straight into it, I think, and take a look at what the prize is. Um, you know, we're all seeking alpha here. So uh, Dan Shainer, I thought I would start with you and ask if you could give us some real-world examples of how at Chimera you've used alternative data to improve the investment process. Okay, Tim. Thank you. Good question. And I'm happy to give you a couple of examples with uh, the caveat that, of course, what you're about to hear is a very, very small sample of uh, what we think alternative data can do based on exclusively our own experience. Um, we do primarily two things with alternative data, and I would categorize them as uh, now casting and projecting the future. Now casting is basically as simple as figuring out, hey, what happened last quarter? And projecting the future is trying to project something hopefully important and useful, you know, a few quarters or years into the future. Uh, so let's talk about now casting uh, briefly. Um, I would say, I don't know if you guys would agree with me or not, but uh, as recently as five years ago, if you just had access to credit card data, which I'm sure m many of you are familiar with, and certainly somebody from Majestic would be very familiar with, um, you had an edge just because it hadn't been uh, fully distributed to the rest of the market that does consumer and retail. Uh, but over the past five years, as credit card data has become a lot more uh, distributed, um, gaining a now casting edge based on it alone has become really tough. So where we've started to move and where I think the market's moving is to start building ensembles based on multiple data sets that are independent of each other but track more or less the same thing. Um, the chief benefit of building ensembles from independent data sources is that the ensemble that you come up with ultimately, if you do it right, is more precise and frequently more robust than just any of the data sources individually. And that creates multiple opportunities, uh, including spotting situations where one of the more popular data sets is going to be wrong this time, and if that's the thing that most of the market uses to imply consensus, well, that becomes a really wonderful opportunity. And it's just one example of uh, sort of, you know, something creative you can do with alternative data. Um, if you were to start looking at uh, something a little bit more fundamental and projecting the future, alternative data gives us and, and others a, a suite of tools that are uh, really powerful for projecting the future. And two of our favorites are uh, cohort analysis and cross-shopping analysis. I'll just give you brief examples of the two. Uh, from, from COVID during this past cycle, um, cohort analysis, i.e. figuring out what's happening with tranches of, uh, of consumers in real time, we were able to find a wholesale uh, membership club where the new customers they acquired were going to be very sticky and um, stick around for a long time post-COVID. That became a good long. Flip side, a furniture retailer that uh, sold uh, e-commerce furniture, consuming empty calories while well, new customers they acquired weren't going to stick around for a long time, became a great short. Uh, and then briefly, so I don't take too much time, uh, cross-shopping analysis. I think one of the best trades we've ever done was discovering a situation where a uh, e-commerce retailer that sold pet food entered the pet pharmacy space, and we were able to use the analysis of where particular customers from the incumbents were shopping in real time to discover that this new entrant was going to dis basically disintermediate the entire space. All the customers from the incumbents went to the new uh, entrant, and we were able to see in real time that they weren't coming back. Uh, so I, I would say that uh, alternative data can help you with both things, now casting and if used creatively also longer-term projections. Thank, thank you, Dan. Um, Mike, Dan was talking a lot there about uh, the, the research that, that alternative data is used for. From, from your perspective, are there questions that you previously thought couldn't be answered by data that now can be? Yeah, actually quite a lot. So, <clears throat> you know, let's, uh, so when we talk about alternative data, let's define what they are, right? So, you know, I kind of define it quite, quite broadly. Uh, I consider alternative data pretty much anything that's not traditional financial statement based, right? you know, income statement or balance sheet. So, so you're talking about textual information, you're talking about, you know, credit cards, satellites, and, um, you know, biographical database, you know, pe you know, whatever supply, you know, graphs and so on, right? So there's a lot. So, I mean, I think three main things off the top of my head. One is the, uh, the value of intangibles, right? So um, how, do you, how do you value, the, how, do you, how do you assess the value of a brand, the value of a patent portfolio, um, you know, that can all more, you know, can be better answered with uh, alternative data, right? Second thing is sentiment. Are people in, in a company or 
or you know, the company being viewed positively by its various stakeholders. I think that's uh, that's something that you know alternative data can answer better than traditional data sets. And finally, um, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, Dan mentioned the noun casting and then for you know forward looking, right? Forward looking projections. I think the traditional financial statement based uh, information are quite limited in that regard. So, so using alternative data, you can get some insights into those aspects. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Tony, turning to you, um, we, we see alternative data being used extensively now, both in the, quant, in the quant world, but also in the fundamental world. I'd be interested to know what you see as the difference in how data is used in those two different approaches. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I was uh, fortunate enough, to, uh, I ran uh, Majestic Research, which was the first sort of alternative data-based research firm, and uh, we had a number of both uh, discretionary and, and, and quant clients. And then prior to joining Two Sigma, I spent five years as a partner at a you know, Tiger Cub sort of concentrated discretionary fund um, where we leveraged lots of alternative data. So you know, from, from both the uh, provider side as well as uh, the principal side, um, I, I've gotten to you know get a flavor of you know the the differences, and so uh, a couple of the differences. One, uh, you know, when when you're in a concentrated portfolio, um, your threshold uh, for the type of edge you need to make money is much higher than it is if you're more diversified, right? And so you know, if you only own a small number of equities you really have to go very deep into each one, or even into just like sourcing new ideas. You have to go quite deep. And then when you're committing capital, you want to understand the business, you know, sometimes in ways that management doesn't even understand if you have um, access to data that they don't. And I could give you a lot of funny examples where we were teaching management things about their business at my former uh, position. And so, you know, the, the threshold, you know, for an edge, and, and some of these discretionary funds might spend you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more, on a data set that could only give them an edge on one name that they care about, right? That, that wouldn't be the most efficient use of capital for a quant, where you're looking at thousands of names, um, and you're looking at things cross-sectionally, and if you only have a small edge, you know, because you're employing leverage, and you want to take as many bets as possible where you think you have an edge, you know, then, then that's something that you can use in a way that a discretionary investor uh, can't. Another interesting difference is in the quant side, um, where we run lots of simulations and we can say, you know, these are the different types of models uh, that we could build with this data cross-sectionally. Here are some, you know, plain vanilla features. It gives you a real metric that you can kind of measure uh, the marginal incremental P&L that you're going to get from licensing a data set and then maybe apply some multiple to that as far as what you're willing to pay for the data set. Whereas I feel like it's more loosey-goosey on the discretionary side in terms of how you price and value a data set. Lastly, I, I would just say that it's not an either or. Um, most quants, including at Two Sigma, if you look at our job, job board, you'll see a lot of job applications for people who have a background in the discretionary side. Um, people with that background will help us think more creatively uh, into the types of features that we can create, um, what are the you know, important you know, under, underlying drivers of businesses. And meanwhile, every discretionary shop of consequence uh, in all likelihood has a pretty strong data science effort whereby they're hiring quants. Thanks. Um, I'd love to hear some of those stories, Tony, but I won't ask you. Um, as a follow-up question, I mean, you've, you've been in the industry for a long time. Um, what do you think are the most significant changes over the last 10 years that you've seen in alternative data? Yeah, uh, well, I think um, my, my colleague said something that, that uh, my colleague here, my peer, uh, that resonated with me in terms of the difference between, you know, now casting and forecasting. Um, you know, like any type of sort of arbitrage strategy, like if, you, if I can use credit card data um, to understand, you know, what Starbucks same store sales are doing, uh, that's different from consensus. Years ago, that's something that you could make a lot of money just trading those types of um, information arbitrage opportunities. Today, you know, 
you, you have to have a certain amount of hubris to think that you're the only one that's going to be able to make money. It's a zero-sum game at a certain point. And so it's really trying to think in a more nuanced way. What are the uh, types of questions you can ask that matter for the future that you can use the, um, the, the, the alternative data to really get conviction in a strong uh, investment thesis? So I think you know, the types of questions people are asking of the data uh, becomes more and more nuanced, more and more about really understanding what are the longer term drivers of a business. Um, you know, and then the other thing is, you know, that the, there's just more of that data out there. And, uh, you know, we're, we're finding different data across new sectors, across new geographies. And so, uh, you know, years ago, it was almost exclusively the North American consumer uh, with some healthcare sprinkled in. And now, you know, there's all sorts of sectors. I, I think the good news is I still think we're scratching the surface. I think, you know, there's great things in the future. And, you know, not just for investors, but you know, for market research in general, I think is an industry ripe for disruption. And you, you see some of the acquisitions that market research companies are making in the alt data space because they see the writing on the wall too, and realize that like, you know, surveys and focus groups are, are going to be a you know, a much smaller part going forward. So. Uh, Dan, you're from the data supply side at S&P. Do you share similar views or do you see things differently? What do you think's changed in the last 10 years? I definitely, uh, I think Tony touched on a lot of uh, important points there. From the vendor side, you know, I'd say the biggest change we've seen has been in the type of client looking for alternative data. Uh, 10 years ago, and to some extent even five years ago, it was almost exclusively the, the sort of data science, quant, investment management, public, usually equities, and North American focused uh, shop, whereas today we're seeing an ever increasing demand uh, from the fundamental side, from private markets, is a big space uh, that's in development, from X North America. Um, and as, as the as the adoption has gotten broader and the diversity of the base using the alternative data has gotten broader, so has the data itself. The other thing I'll say is, in addition to the increase in breadth, has been the increase in depth. Uh, I think probably because some of the early adopters were those quant and data science shops that wanted to place a large number of bets, uh, the content sets that gained traction were uh, content sets that spoke to the whole universe uh, of, of uh, public equities usually. Uh, now we're seeing uh, more adoption of nuanced data sets that may only inform on, say, 30 names, but it's very deep, industry-rich content. Um, and then the last thing I'll say as far as, as, far as uh, developments in space, technology. Uh, and I know that that's one that, that we've been hearing for 10 years, technology is, is growing so fast, but if you think about it, it's just 25, 30 years ago that we still had clients getting CompuStat data on CD-ROM. We would mail them the CDs uh, at the end of each month. And now we have uh, summer interns in in uh, house that are all fluent in PySpark and standing up ML stacks on AWS and using four terabytes of data in the cloud. And they're you know they're doing it from home on their sofa. I think the implications of that sort of technology development just, uh, is just still not fully baked in uh, to the industry yet. So, I mean, from both of you, it sounds like there's a combination of more data, but better technology, but also the way that the data is being used. People are just getting smarter at asking better questions of the data and kind of pushing it, I suppose. And I th it seems to me that it's obvious that it's, A, it's here to stay, and B, it's, you know, some people will be continuing to use alternative data to stay ahead of the game. Other people will be forced to use it just to keep up. Um, so, D Dan, if I could go back to you, what, do, what are the, some of the things that people get wrong? What's, what's difficult about using alternative data? Uh, well, there's probably a million mistakes that you can make with... Um uh, the use of alternative data, and I, I think we should know because we focus on alternative data so much that we've probably made more than our fair share of them. Uh, so I, I can't talk about all of the difficulties and mistakes, but I can give you a common one that I see people make all the time, especially people that are new to alternative data, which is basically relying too much or exclusively on historical correlations and statistical analysis methods in order to make their projections. 
And there's a couple of reasons for why that's really problematic with alternative data, unlike with some other um, you know, market data sources that you know, quants use uh, effectively and successfully. Um, you know, it, it's that, one, um, usually there's very little history uh, in an alternative data set, especially a relatively new one, and uh, even fewer correlatable data points because a lot of these things only um, correlate to something on a quarterly basis. And what that means is, is if you're using exclusively statistical mathematical methods, you are very often vastly underestimating or overestimating the uh, precision of the data set uh, that you're using and how prone it is to large breakdowns. And the second biggest problem with relying on uh, math exclusively is that if you're not investing the time to understand the fundamental link between the data set and the KPI that you're trying to check, uh, track uh, with it, um, th you will get things massively wrong when the underlying correlations between the data and the KPI change. And that happens all the time. Uh, a really good example of this is once again COVID and a number of different transactional data sources. Because those of us that work with data know that all data sets have biases, right? None of them are perfect. And the simplest types of biases that happen all the time in panels are regional, demographic, and sales channel biases. Well, it turned out that COVID was the perfect storm of throwing all three of those factors uh, up into the air in uh, unprecedented ways, right? So you had rolling uh, shutdowns of the economy, which made regional trends um, uh, very different. You had fiscal stimulus, which uh, disproportionately benefited lower demographics on a relative basis. And then, of course, you had a massive shift away from brick and mortar towards e-commerce. Uh, which, uh, you know, um, uh, threw a lot of channel uh, correlations uh, up into the air. And so if you didn't understand the fundamental link between the data that you're sampling, uh, essentially, uh, and what you're trying to track, um, you got a lot of things very wrong over the past couple of years, and I know a lot of people did. On the other hand, if you took the time to understand the links and to, to normalize for those situations, you were actually given a phenomenal opportunity. Anyone else like to add to that, uh, things that they see as the challenges and, uh, and what people get wrong? Looking at you here, Tony. <laughs> I mean, I've made more than my share of mistakes. You know, I mean, one thing, you know, certainly on the discretionary side, uh, which is a little bit mitigated by a more systematic strategy is, um, Unstructured, large amounts of alternative data is incredibly rich. Uh, but one pitfall of discretionary investing is what we call confirmation bias. And you've got an investment thesis, and you could be prone to find within the data what you're looking for, which is great if you're in the consulting business, but not so good if you're in the investing business. Um, and so really trying to make sure that you can not just interpret the data in a way that conforms to a pre-existing investment thesis, but try to remove that bias and look at the data in an you know, intellectually honest way. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and if you can do that, then maybe it can challenge your uh, conviction and you might decide not to invest in something because you had it wrong, you know, which is difficult for some of us to admit, right? Uh, so I do think that's one of the ways uh, that, you know, people can go astray with the uh, alt data. Yeah, I can mention a few things. I think, um, you know, first of all, there's, you have to treat the data properly, right? If you're not really, you know, fluent at using alternative data, I mean, there, or just data in general, there are a couple of pitfalls, such as look at bias, point in time bias, right? You know, survivorship bias. Is, all the data looked great, you know, but you know what? The, the data set has removed all the company that went out of business already, right? So, so, so you know, so you, so that that these are huge issues. Um, another issue is that I mean, alternative data or traditional data, data is just data, right? And data is when it when it comes to the power of predicting a, whether a security will go up or down. I mean, there are multiple things that derives why a security will go up or down. Data just tells you a vi from a very small angle. It's like you're looking at an elephant through a keyhole, right? Even if you, you, know, you have a perfect view of that through that keyhole and say, okay, this stock will go up. You know what, maybe the Fed you know, come out with some surprisingly hawkish statement that's not factored into it, right? So n never pay, never completely trust one or two or even you know, 10 whatever pieces of data set. You really gotta have, you know, look, you, you gotta have multiple angles to look at your investment. 
portfolio, you know, so you, so you can get a certain amount of, um, you know, confidence in, into your investment. Well, and we, sorry. Dan, I'll have one ahead. more. Please uh, do. So I, I'd say with a lot of the alternative data out there, uh, to unlock the value and extract the insights, we need new capabilities. Uh, I think one of the best examples is natural language processing uh, and textual data. And so it's not just the data that's new, it's also the capability that's new. Oftentimes that capability is still being developed and, and might not necessarily be at its, at its best yet, quite yet. Um, and how do you know if, if the insights that you're generating from that new capability is actually telling you what you think it's telling you? Uh, that's a big challenge. Mm. Um, Mike, we were talking last week when we were prepping for this that one of the challenges with data is that it's, it can be patchy. Um, either you've got a short history or you don't have regional coverage in a certain area. So if the data's patchy, there's always risks associated with that. So could you un unpack that a little bit from a research point of view? Yeah, so actually this is one a huge challenge, especially if you come from a more um, traditional asset pricing perspective, right, the Pharma French School. So you know, if you want to look at value, quality, momentum, you can literally go back 100 years, right, or more, actually. I think uh, one of my colleagues recently looked at value investing from the 1860s. And guess what? Over the last 150 years, it's actually generally worked, right? Well, you know, with alternative data, it's just not possible to go back 160 years. It's barely even possible to go back 10 or 15 years, really, right? So what do you have to do? Well, I think, you know, I, I think one, one way to get around this problem, you know, as a quant is that, you have, you know, you have to have a, a solid economic rationale first, right? You have to understand, you know, like not fancy, you know, um, it just works out that way or high correlation, but why is it intuitively this thing should work? So I use the credit card as an example. So if you have a data set that tell you, you know, company A has high credit card sales, um, the, you, you know, then you say, okay, well, if high credit card sell all else equal, you know, probably e equal to, you know, high overall sales, which leads to high revenue, which leads to high, you know, stock price or, you know, asset price, right, which is very basic. But this is an economic hypothesis you made, right? So now then with all the tools that you have, you have to be able to basically test each step of this economic channel. Um, in, you know, in quant parlance, this is what's called ancillary testing. You're looking for ancillary evidence instead of direct evidence of stock, you know, going back, going higher or lower in the back test, right? So you, you know, price correlation or price prediction in, in the back test is not enough because you never see the back back test. You have to check all the other, you know, things around this. If this is true, what else must be true? And if it isn't true, you have to ask yourself very honestly why it isn't true. And, um, and you know, I mentioned the word honest, right? Being honest is super important. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you can fool yourself all you want. You can't fool the market. So I think, you know, having incentive, keeping people honest is very, very important. And how do you keep people honest? Well, people respond to incentives, right? I mean, I mean that's just the way it, it, it works. So. You know, one of the way to keep people honest is actually have people's pay tied to the signal they research, what they develop, right? You know, over, over a period of time. Um, you know, if the stuff that you, you develop, you say it work, it actually works, then you get paid, right? Or, you know, you get paid more. Um, you know, I think this is a very powerful mechanism to keep people honest. Mm. It's interesting. It, you know, the example of alternative data that always trips off the tongue is credit card data. Um, and actually, in one of the sessions this morning, somebody mentioned the fact that um, eventually the alpha potential in a signal will decay. And I think credit card data is... There's, there, I mean, in general, I mean, if you use credit card data in a straightforward manner, there's no alpha already. I no, because... There hasn't yeah, been alpha for years. Yeah, and credit card data is, is essentially the new consensus. Um, you know, there may be variations in where you get it from, but the alpha has decayed. It's, it's like it has a shelf life of a data set. So, Dan... For, for from a, the supply, the, the point of view of somebody who supplies data, how do you reconcile that with your customers? The Listen, 100% there is a shelf life. There's a shelf life um, for all these products. I'd say when we think about a particular, uh, a particular data product, uh, one that is adding an edge only in its timeliness of reporting information it's probably going to have a shorter shelf life because it'll be broadly adopted and then everybody's getting the, the information that quickly. What uh, tends to have a longer shelf life is content that informs on uh, movement and logistics, the, the, the movement of, of people, money, and things. Uh, likewise, if the content is used standalone, 
then it's going to have a shorter shelf life than if it uh, marries well with other content and finds synergy. Uh, if a data set is plug and play, shorter shelf life. If it's got, uh, if there's a capability, like I had mentioned earlier, uh, needed to extract the information, then the shelf life's longer and, and tied to the development of that capability as well. So, um, Mike, back to you. Um, given that context, that uh, well, two things actually, and I'm sorry to spring this on you, but is, do you think it's important to use multiple signals from different data sets in combination? And do you think you can build a strategy that's comprised it just exclusively of alternative data, or do you roll fundamental data into that as well? Yeah, I definitely think it's you know um, useful to use multiple combina combination of multiple signals, not just combination of multiple signal, but multiple data sets in a signal, actually, right? Um, you know, again, use the credit card example. Credit card in a very straightforward application has no alpha for several years now, but if you combine it with something else, which I won't mention you know what, guess what, we, we actually have been able to extract alpha from it, right? So, so, that, um, so definitely multiple signals is good, right? And um, what's the second question? Sorry. <laughs> um, the second question is, do you think you can build a strategy just yeah, using alternative yeah, data? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so in, in general, I, I, I think it's difficult, actually. So, you know, we, we, we it, it, listen, I mean, you know, I, I'm, the head of alternative alpha research, so obviously I, I think alternative alpha, alternative data is the, is you know the greatest thing since sliced bread, and I you know bash pharma French whenever I can, but you know what, pharma French factors still explain about roughly two thirds of the market cross sectional variation, right? So if you're only using alternative data, you're basically missing a huge part of market drivers. Um, so so you know I, and, and for most of the quant strategy, unless you run you know relatively short horizon say anything between three, three months or longer, you really need to have this still more fundamental data in there. I mean, rule of thumb, not always, but rule of thumb is alternate data tends to decay faster, tends to have faster horizon, right? So they tend to not work as well over a longer horizon. So for anything three months or longer holding period, you typically want to have you know, a combination of traditional and alternative data, just from personal experience. Um, obviously, you can build shorter horizon signals, right? And we have, and then, you know, stuff that also include using, you know, a lot of machine learning or, you know, stat arb type of stuff, right? And those kind of strategies, um, in some cases, you may be able to just mostly or purely rely on alternative data. Okay. Um, do you have a perspective I, I on that? Like, you know, and I agree with you know, nearly everything you said, but I, I do think that you know when we say that the, the credit card data you know, has no more alpha. You're talking about like the most naive way of exactly. using the credit no, card data. Most straightforward. If you ask the it. right questions, I still think it's one of the most rich and fruitful data sets out there. And particularly if you apply different types of you know, machine learning and you know cohort analysis, like you know, there's. We still don't have to tell people that. Let them keep thinking there's no alpha left. <laughs> no, I agree with you. What I meant is basically just super naive. You know, brain dead. Just okay, yeah. get in, and use it. Right. <laughs> um, uh, Dan, back to you. I, I, I've heard people often say, well, if your data is so good, why don't you just trade it yourself? Why do you sell it to other people? How do you, how do you cope with that? Yeah, I mean, so I'd say that uh, good data and analytics are a necessary but not a sufficient condition for a successful asset management shop. There are uh, quite a number of uh, other, other things that go into it, right? Um, and I don't think I have to tell the audience here. Uh, about that. Uh, I would say, you know, SP Global and, and myself personally, I think, um, add value to the process by sourcing uh, and vetting differentiated data and uh, by standardizing the presentation and the delivery of the content and uh, developing those capabilities for the feature extraction. And we're doing that at scale. Uh, so, you know, trading assets, I don't think, helps add to our personal alpha. Mm. And so shifting gear a little bit here, I'm, I'm, we're also charged with talking about regulation. So from the point of view of somebody who sells data, what are, what are the hoops and concerns and the, and the red flags that you have to pay attention to when figuring out how to take a product to market? Yeah, the, the regulatory question is tricky because it's not a matter of being compliant today. 
It's a matter of thinking about where the regulatory environment is going to be 10 years from now, and it's changing very quickly. Um, <clears throat> I think the biggest focus uh, f that we've seen from regulators and, and what we continue to think is, is going to be a big focus moving forward is uh, personal data. And I'm not just talking about the PII, but also the anonymized content. Uh, that's, that's probably going to see more regulation. We're very mindful about those anonymized records and, and uh, the likelihood of re-identification, so we've built processes in-house to uh, assess how likely uh, and how impactful uh, that re-identification might be. Where possible, we aggregate records, which makes re-identification more difficult. Um, another big uh, point with compliance is making sure that you're collecting content in a way that's consistent with terms and conditions. And uh, for that, we've, we've got a team that sources that internally. And we do all that due diligence on our end of the fence so that uh, when the folks that are trading the assets uh, get the data in hand, they don't need to go through that risk assessment again. We've done a lot of that for them. OK. Um, Tony, from, from, a, from the buy side perspective, what, what, are you, what are the red flags for you from a regulatory perspective? But also, what, is, what are you looking for in a data set that, that really gets you excited? Well, I mean, you're looking for unique insights that you can't get without that data set. So, you know, whether on the quant side or, or, or the discretionary side, you know, my philosophy has always been start with the most important questions to answer, where if I could answer this question, I think, you know, we might be able to profit from that. And by the way, I think that's a generalizable way to think about things. You don't just have to be an investor. Um, you know, regulatory risk is a real thing, you know, not just with alternative data, but, um, you know, other data as well. Um, you know, every shop I've worked at has taken an extremely conservative approach to, you know, everything regulatory. Um, I do think, you know, from just a marketing perspective, um, you know, you look at firms like ad tech uh, who leverage a lot of the same data sets as investors, and they actually do, I think, uh, you know, no, like I said, I'm not casting shade at the ad tech industry, but they do make a business out of targeting individuals where that's the last thing an investor cares about. Um, and there's been, you know, data um, that we've come across where they'll sell to ad tech but not to a hedge fund. And, you know, we're sort of, you know, we take such care um, and, and we do not care at all, and we monitor every way the data gets used. So, um, you know, I just think it's a little bit ironic um, from, from, from that sense. Maybe uh, uh, the investment management space needs a better lobbying industry. Um, but, you know, you know, there's a lot of good legal minds um, making sure that, you know, you know, nothing exploits, you know, and these types of PII, you know, violations are MNPI, and um, and you know, I think we do a good job of it. I'm sure. I'm sure you do. Um, Dan, from from your perspective, when your regulations aside, perhaps, but when you're looking at a data set and evaluating it, what do, what are you looking for? What are the good things and the bad things that you see in data before you make a purchase decision? Sure. Uh, before I answer that question, I just want to say. I, I think no matter how good of a lobbying industry we, uh, we hire, no one's going to shed a tear for us. So one way or another, uh, we're going to need to be really um, solid on data hygiene. And um, sort of to move on to your actual question, as far as what we look for when we evaluate a new data set, I hope I don't insult anybody by providing a really simplistic answer. And I don't think I'm giving away any state secrets when I say we look for data sets that correlate to KPIs that tend to move stock prices. I mean, it's, it's like it's not rocket science. Uh, and ideally, as I mentioned before, um, we want to find a data set where we understand where it's coming from upstream so that we can understand the funda fundamental link between the data and what we're trying to track so that if that changes, we can normalize uh, and, and adjust. Um, the most valuable data sets check both of those boxes independently, but we wouldn't turn our noses up at a data set which uh, perhaps is imperfect on either of those two criteria as long as it has some level of independence and some level of correlation relative to our existing data ensemble. Because again, I think everything is moving towards ensembles. And what we care about is, is there marginal value? Can, can a data set which is perhaps useless to most people on its own, 
make our existing ensemble just a fraction uh, better and uh, more predictive and more robust. Um, on the other side of the coin, there's lots of things that we've learned to look out for that are red flags for data sets perhaps not being uh, so useful, and I'll just uh, throw out a few of them just because they happen so often. Um, so first, unclear where the data is coming from upstream. You can hide a lot of uh, nasty stuff when you're not telling potential customers where the data is coming from. Um, signs of cherry picking. So let's say I get uh, you know, uh, a bunch of back tests where a uh, certain number of companies are selected and certain back tests are shown. And there's, I know there's several other companies that have the same KPIs which should be trackable through the same data set but they're missing. Oftentimes it's because actually the data is not that good and they just chose the six or seven that sort of look the best. A um, uh, huge red flag is when back tests change. You have to evaluate data sets over time and see whether predictions hold across multiple quarters. And you, you better save all the back tests that you're sent because large percentage of the time you look back and uh-oh, something changed. And it's, you, know, you, you can see the, uh, uh, the reason why some data vendors would choose to do that uh, when, when something breaks. Um, black box normalizations and projection math methods uh, are, are a big red flag. Um, hopefully it's clear what, what that means. And then finally, um, correlations which look really good before they're seasonalized. In consumer land, everything's seasonal, right? So show me an R squared that looks fant fantastic. Hey, great, because you know Q4 is always high. Uh, that that isn't really useful if it breaks down on a seasonal level. Um, okay, we've got a few minutes left. Let's let's uh, get our crystal balls out and take a look at the future. Um, uh, Dan. Uh, what are you looking forward to? What do you think the next 10 years is going to hold? What do you think is going to be the next innovation in alternative data? So I, I think from the vendor space, the, the uh, word that I keep hearing is consolidation. I, I actually think that might be the wrong word to use. Um, I think of the alternative data pipeline from raw data to decision making as, as uh, 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 it's a process. It's almost, uh, it's, it's almost an assembly line, if you will. And um, the raw data collection, uh, particularly in the alternative data space, we've largely relied on third-party partnerships for that. And that's because some of that uh, alternative data uh, requires specialized tools and specialized knowledge um, to, to, to actually get that into database. Uh, but then what we do really well is the, down, is, is the next step in the process, downstream process, which is to take the content and to standardize the presentation and the delivery and to develop the capabilities to extract the information. And I think as, as the standardization becomes more common, the time for clients to, to and, and end users to trial the data and determine if it enriches their workflow will be shorter. I think as the capabilities get better, the uh, features we extract will get less noisy and um, I think that as the breadth and depth of the content continues to grow, we will see wider adoption. What, um, where's that standardization going to be driven from, do you think? Is that the market pull or people like yourselves getting I think it is. It? I think it is market pulled. So uh, we, we have uh, third party partnerships that we do not white label. They are, uh, you can pull them from our marketplace website and you will see a third party name there, and you can go to that third party name and get that data, but it's not going to have our identifiers. It's not going to have uh, delivery through our channels. And so it's going to be uh, far more difficult to marry that content with other information that exists in our ecosystem today. And by standardizing the, uh, the, the presentation and the delivery, uh, clients can very quickly impound it into their workflows and see if they uh, observe an improved outcome. Okay. Tony, how, what do you think is, does, a, does that sound like a, a place you want to go to? Or, or? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think about the innovations going forward. I think there's, you know, across different dimensions, there's going to be innovations. Um, certainly, you know, the, the types of uh, data that you can access, again, um, it's getting more broad. I feel like the last couple of years we've seen um, game-changing type data become available in the life sciences space. Um, and I do think that um, more sort of B2B type uh, industries like enterprise software are still undercovered uh, 
by uh, you know, non-traditional data sets, but I think we're getting close. So I think you know, we're going to continue to expand across different industries, across different geographies, and that's exciting. And then you know, the technologies that we use to understand the data, um, things like entity resolution, um, and you know, trying to better understand non-intuitive nuance interactions, you know, between what different data sets are saying, um, are, are, are you know problems that lend themselves in a you know pretty profound way to machine learn type solutions. So I do think you know, we'll continue to see that, and uh, and then there'll be other technological innovations, maybe quantum computing, right? That 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 will will change the game. Thanks very much. Uh, Mike, what are your th thoughts in your crystal ball? Sorry. Yeah, a few things. So, um, so I think one thing is that, you know, if you think about the current data vendor, right, what's their business model? They, they basically call everybody they, on their Rolodex, right, and sell. I mean, maybe, you know, to, to Sigma, they, don't, they offer some super special stuff, but for, for me, at least, they, they, you know, I'm probably the... 20th or 50th person getting the call, right? And, and you know, and obviously you can use data in a non-intuitive way, but a lot of data actually have a pretty straightforward application once you get it, right? So, so then we know that economic 101 is too much money chasing after the same idea, you know, you're not gonna get any return. So how do you solve this problem? Well, you know, you, you think of a unique data set that's not been commercialized and you try to collect yourself. But if you're a company like Rubico, who's been around for 90 years and wants to be around for another 90 years, you know, not just regulatory risk, there's actually reputational risk as well, right? We live in, we live in uh, I mean, we're headquartered in, in Europe, so there's GDPR and all that stuff. So, you know, your reputation is one of your most prized asset. So, you know, I, I think what we came across recently, you know, I, I don't think this is new, but there are firms out there that actually collects data for you, that outsources stuff, right? So you kind of can have a little bit of an arm's length relationship, right? So, I, and then, you know, they, they, you ask them to collect it and then the agreement is that they only sell it to you or they basically access your proxy. So I think this would be a sort of a data collection as a service. I think that's one interesting development. Um, and the second thing, not, not so much for us, but maybe for more um, fundamental investors. A lot of fundamental investors get these data. They don't know what to do with it. They don't really know how to do it. So, you know, increasingly, I think data and algorithm, right, you know, how do you analyze data is being packaged together as a, as a you know, as a, as a package solution. So I think that could be an interesting, um, you know, we're already seeing some vendors slash technology provider doing that. I think that's going to become more and more commonplace. He took my mic, so I'm going to shout. Dan, last, last one to you. Uh, sure. So I, I don't want to repeat what um, these guys have already said, so I, I'm just going to rip through my list really fast. Uh, super obvious, there's going to be more data sets coming online over the next several years that we have no idea are coming. Why? Because what's causing alternative data to explode? It's the sensorization of the world, uh, it is the growth of e-commerce, uh, and it is the growth in computing power both for storage and analytics. Very obviously, more data sets are coming online soon. Um, there's going to be a breakout into verticals beyond consumer. That's already happening to some extent. That's going to continue across potentially uh, the rest of... Um, the investable universe, uh, as well as geographic. We're seeing interesting things happening in Asia and uh, in Europe. They're behind in, in maturity, but that's coming. Uh, emphasis on building ensembles based on multiple independent data sets. Uh, obviously, people that are sort of ahead of the curve are already doing this. Eventually, everyone's going to need to catch up. Uh, also, emphasis on projecting the future rather than just now casting, because now casting has only so much potential uh, alpha and benefit to it. Uh, and uh, finally, the you know last major theme I, I think that's already ongoing is the emergence and uh, ongoing consolidation of data supermarkets because there is so much power in blending across different data sets together. In some sense, it's more efficient for that to be done uh, sometimes at a data vendor level rather than each uh, buy side company reinventing the wheel and you know building a big data team. Those are sort of the five things I would say are uh, the major themes for alternative data in, in, in the near future. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, I think we're done. That's a wrap. We're bang on time. So if you wouldn't mind saying thank you to this excellent panel.